but uh, no, anyway, well, good morning, uh, all of you, and thank you very much for uh, attending this panel um, on online and abuse and uh, how this impacts human representation in politics. So, um, first of all, I wanted to start maybe talking a bit about your personal experience in um, with the with the this phenomenon, like what in your life, what um, and in your political career, how has this uh, impacted you? Um, maybe, Marie, do you want to start? Yeah, that's fine. I'll, I'll kick off. So I suppose um, it is there and, and it is not, I would say, restricted entirely to online. I think that there, is a, um, there are some people who are quite abusive in real life as well. And there's, I suppose, a couple of things. There's, there's outright abuse, and there's also that sort of trolling where people just pop up everywhere you are and, and throw their own agendas and ideas at you. And I suppose as a politician and as somebody getting into politics, I kind of thought I have to be there in public and, you know, I, I, I need to interact with people. Um, so it was a bit difficult to work out how to handle that at first we quite quickly actually I had a good friend who was helping me when I was starting out and he just he was doing helping me with my Facebook and he just deleted all the nastiness and um, we settled into something more compromising where we don't delete the nastiness so I tend to have a set of rules where I will um, challenge people or delete their comments if they call me a Nazi if they call me a Stasi if they swear at me um, if they are homophobic or racist or that type of thing. So just the sort of things that you would tend to rule out in normal conversations, I rule out in online conversations as well. And most of the rest, I just leave it be and don't and ignore it. You know, somebody um, is commenting on one of my columns about housing, you know, called me a harpy, which is, you know, a fairly unpleasant and a gendered term, interestingly. Um, but you know, I just leave it there. So be it. It's not doing any great harm, and it's not. Um, it's not uh, particularly um, breaking the rules of free speech. So we've settled into a sort of a a way of dealing with it. I I also kind of have a rule. I mean, I find largely social media has been for most of the time I've been a politician quite a positive place for me there's a few times that's an exception but that's largely because I treat it like a so I treat Twitter and I've said this to lots of people I treat it like a crowded bar and it's absolutely booming and there's people chatting all over the place and I walk in and I can see out the corner of my eye the drunk belligerent folk at the bar being mean and I just walk on by without making eye contact and I suppose the skills that I've, you learn going through life are the kind of skills that help you to navigate in, in the virtual world as well so for me mostly Twitter has been quite a nice place because I mostly just interact with people who I want to mm -hmm. uh, rather than interacting with people who are abusing me and I you know what do they say? Don't feed the trolls. Don't don't fight back. Don't give them your energy. Um, that it's not always possible. It's not always possible to do that. And there are times when you feel, and particularly if your own resilience is low. So I think over the course of the last year, when people have had to be coping with really difficult situations, it can be quite hard to tolerate that. Um, but mostly. I've had an okay time on Twitter with one or two and, and Facebook with one or two uh, exceptions, which I'm sure we'll get into as we go on. No, that's right. Thank you. And um, Rhoda, do you want to uh, share your own experience? Um, I, th I suppose similar in, in lots of ways. I, I guess I do my own Twitter. Um, I do, t my staff will do Facebook for me, well, they'll post on Facebook, but I also kind of do an awful lot of that myself and read the comments. Um, like Marie, um, if, if there's swearing, if there's, you know, really grim stuff, 
I delete, um, you know, or block, and um, if that's. But to be honest, there's some of the, like the comment about a harpy. There are some comments that I think that actually says more about you than me. And you you sometimes just leave them up saying, you know, I, I hope your mother reads this kind of, <laughs> kind of um, you know, kind of stuff, because I think, you know, that is just, so I suppose my, my rule of thumb is, will it offend somebody else? Um, so if it is racist or um, there's swearing and stuff like that, where it might, you know, you have to be conscious that it could be kids reading your page, you know, so you 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 have to have that kind of view. Um, but, you know, if it's just people being bad. So it, it, and it happens in lots of different ways. I don't find that people are abusive unless you are you know, a, a Hastings or something, pe most people I bump into are nice, you know, even if they dis disagree with you, they're pleasant and very seldom do you get any of that direct abuse, but kind of, I, I'm old enough to remember the days before social media and you got the unsigned nasty letter, you know, they, they used to come. So those people have always been around. Social media makes it easier for them, I think, especially Twitter where, you can hide who you are, so it's a bit like the anonymous letter, um, but it's for all the world to see. Um, I think Facebook is more difficult because you have to have, and your friends follow you, so what you say on Facebook are is a bit more moderated by kind of people in general, whereas I think Twitter can be an awful place, and that's why blocking is a very good idea when um, that happens. Oh, that's great, thank you. And uh, uh, what about you, Molly? Yeah, well, I mean, I would I would echo quite a lot of what Marie and Rhoda have said, and I think there is a difference between um, what I what I receive on Facebook versus what I receive on Twitter, and a large amount of that is because Facebook you have your name attached um, in the majority of cases, so it's it's quite different. Um, I think I I've always grown up with the internet, and I kind of I think I was prepared for what I was getting into and when I you know thought about standing I did think you know this is going to be quite tough um, from a social media point of view do I still want to do it and I, I that consideration is one that many women will will think about and it's it's not an easy decision but um, I I don't think anyone is quite prepared for the first time you get piled on with abuse on Twitter but I have found that since that happened the first time, I felt a lot more resilient. Um, but yeah, I, I receive a lot of um, uh, gendered abuse, but a lot of ageist abuse as well. I think that's that's one of the big things is people saying, you know, things like, you know, she looks like a schoolgirl. You know, why would we listen to the opinion of a teenager? I'm not a teenager, but these are the things that people say. And um, there's definitely, it, there's an intersection of, of both gender and age there. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I mean, on Facebook, I, I also tend to leave it up unless it's um, overtly, you know, a, a, abusive um, a, in a way that would not be acceptable in normal conversation. It can get a little bit hairy because people start to argue amongst themselves. And I think then there's another consideration to take as to whether you allow that to happen on your channel or not. Um, but um, generally speaking, I think we do all walk a fine line of deciding whether or not to leave it up um, or take it down. What I think we all experience is that there is some sort of, um, you know, emotional impact, whether we think there is or not. Subconsciously, there's definitely um, some sort of, um, you know, th there's something there, um, regardless of whether or not you actually let it get to you day to day. No, definitely. And well, of course, you were mentioning the impact on more, well, I guess, your mind. And I'm trying to think, how does it that impact your mental health on a daily basis? Because it's um, because you're such a public figure, uh, you go out there and um, you receive these comments. And of course, you can walk away from that, but probably up to a point sometimes, especially the first ones that you receive and you mentioned. So um, how does that 
how does it impact your mental health um, when you receive those comments? I mean, I think one of the toughest things is when it's people you know. So I've grown up in the Highlands. I know loads of people all over the Highlands. I'm well known, even before I got into politics. And I think, gosh, you think you can say that to me just because I'm a politician? You would never have said that to me before. Um, so that's quite, you know, that, and I guess Molly will be feeling that as well. Rhoda's been a politician for as long as I remember. <laughs> Sorry, Rhoda. <laughs> So, so you might you might not have had that experience of being known in a different way beforehand. But you know, I worked in mental health. I was a health professional, and I had friends all over the Highlands. And and suddenly, because I'm a public figure, it, it, it's okay to abuse me. Um, and I just find that I that that's when I find it a bit hurtful or hard to comprehend. And what's funny is people are definitely keyboard warriors. So I remember um, last summer being at home in Ullapo with my dad and, and we walked past someone who regularly abuses me on Facebook and my dad and he made eye contact and it stopped, you know, because he kind of, it must have just reminded him that I was a real person um, and that he'd known me my whole life since I was a child. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it, it's a weird thing. I don't, and I guess that's what social media enables you to do, but the same thing does happen in real life. So people do, you know, at town hall meetings, I can remember the town hall meetings before we were all only communicating this way. And sometimes people will say really awful things and kind of forget that you're a human being just because you're in politics. And that is a bit odd. I, I'm reasonably resilient. Um, and I suppose the other thing with social media is that you often don't see it. My social media is so busy um, and there's so many people, you know, trying to tag me in so many different things. I miss an awful lot of, the, of what goes on on it. Um, and if there's a particularly abusive conversation just kicking off, I just mute it there and then. So I, I don't see an awful lot um, of it. Uh, it's just every once in a while it manages to break through. And the other time it hurts. I mean, I wouldn't say it affects my mental health, but if you are feeling low and resilient, so this year has been tough. Um, and, you know, we've I've certainly felt the weight of responsibility as a government minister um, throughout the pandemic. Uh, we've had to make really difficult decisions. And, and, you know, our families have been threatened. We've had to stay apart from the people who support us, all of these things. So I've certainly found it less easy to cope with in the last year than, you know, I would have beforehand. Um, and I suppose the other thing is our entire lives are conducted online in the last year, which they weren't beforehand. So you maybe are exposed to more of it. Um, I don't know if there's also, I mean, I suppose, um, I, I try to put out positivity every day. So I try, I do like my Daily Mile and a lot of people who are not remotely interested in politics on Twitter contact me and say, or when I meet them in real life, they say, we love your Daily Mile. We love that daily mindfulness. We love that daily slice of positivity, that optimism. So there are good things. And the other thing I would say is, I mean, I was joking, excuse my dog. Um, <laughs> I don't know if he's barking at the snow or if there is someone actually coming to the house. One of the things is not to forget the nice stuff. So, you know, like I met someone on Twitter recently who just, I don't know how she came onto my timeline and she was cooking the most amazing um, rhubarb puddings. And I love rhubarb. And I just messaged her and said, oh, could I get any chance I could have the recipe. So there's still normal stuff that people do happening in that space. You know, I'm still swapping recipes with people. I'm still getting book recommendations. I'm still getting recommendations of what to watch on telly, just the stuff you would normally do if you were socializing. Um, so it's not all bad, is what I would say. And I, yeah, I love, I love to eat. <laughs> excuse me. I love the swapping recipes. <laughs> No, it's okay. I'm wondering if Molly and Rhoda want to maybe share um if I don't know have you have you had more um issues throughout the pandemic as well um as Mary um I, I don't think it's been more throughout the pandemic I suppose early on what I did was um I switched off notifications 
So I only get notifications from Facebook and Twitter when I go in to Facebook and Twitter. So if there's anything happening, um, and folk are trolling you and something, you know, you it's your choice to go in and look. So I think that's quite a good thing. I think if you're feeling down and then you go in and folk are pouring a lot of grief at you, then that's not going to help you any. But I, I found over the pandemic that people are really nice. We, I mean, we've always had really nice kind of thank you letters and stuff like that. But I don't know if it's people are just kind of really lost at the moment. But people always write back in, you know, much more so. I mean, I think previously folk expected you to do your job and, you, you know, you, you would get the odd nice letter, you know, talking about maybe 1% of your cases or something like that. That's probably gone up to, you know, about 5% of cases or something like that. You're getting really nice letters back. Um, and that kind of helped. I think because that's the real world um, and I, I suppose the only thing that really kind of gets me is on your like I have my private page which you know I share my photos with my family and you know all those kind of stuff and I've got like with my private account and my public page and sometimes the odd time there's been like one example family member and because it's your private page you've got everybody you've got your friends you've got totally different political persuasions and none from from myself and this person um I actually thought a lot of started like you know if I would repost something political and you know lots of people who I'm friends with repost politics that are not mine I've just never commented on theirs unless it's a discussion about a policy area or something like that. But if they're posting, you know, vote SNP because whatever, I just ignore, you know, just that's what they're allowed to do. I can post vote Labour. And this person, when I would do my Labour stuff, which I don't do a lot on my personal page, um, would just attack. And I just unfriended him. And actually, I think if I meet him again, I'm probably going to have quite a bit of difficulty. And this was somebody I thought a lot of. And that's just one occasion. But um, I think I'll have um, some difficulty with that. And I, sometimes what I'll do in that case is mute someone for a while. So maybe this will pass. Um, and if it doesn't, unfriend. Life's too short. Yeah, Funny um, it's no Rhoda. <laughs> Funny, it's men though. <laughs> yeah, it's always men. I don't, I don't think I've had a problem with any women. <laughs> um, Go on, well, sorry, I interrupted. <laughs> no, no, at all. I, I mean, I agree. It is, it is always men. Um, I uh, what what Marie said really resonated. When you meet people, um, or when you see things from people you know in real life, that is. Uh, it's on a different level and it, it's odd because you know I've had the experience of meeting people you know in real life who'd be like hi how are you nice to see you doing well and then on Facebook that night they're like you know she's a charlatan all of these things you know it's just completely it's a lot of cognitive dissonance um I, I think of myself as being pretty resilient but I actually really worry about my friends and family um because they didn't sign up for any of this and um particularly my family I think worry um and they because this is a public forum they see things as well um and I'll get messages from friends I'll get messages from extended family saying I've seen this I've seen that are you okay and I do think it, it, it's not fair on them um it, it's not something they should have to experience but uh generally speaking I would say um I can't really speak to before the pandemic because um, my my experience in politics has been actually completely within a pandemic so far. But um, but the tenor the tenor of discussion online um, has definitely I would say heated up in recent months, and I think um, you know I, I try and keep it very very civil and 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 try and take down that tone myself to set an example but it doesn't always work um and mental health wise i i think um it's it's difficult to quantify because 
we're, we're living in a pandemic um but for me I, there are moments where it does it does get to you um largely not but certainly um there are moments that i think the mental health impact on friends and family is the thing that i think about most i would wholeheartedly agree with that so i found it when i first got into politics i found it a bit alarming that my children would see these comments and read them to me, although they were usually laughing about it um, in the way that teenagers do. They were all old enough to be on social media, so they would see these things where I might not have spotted them. Um, but recently I had a bit of a pile on um, just a few months ago and my husband actually came off Twitter because he said, I just can't bear to see that and I don't know how you can tolerate it. Um, so it is, it does take a toll on people you love. My parents are pretty, um, you know, they, they, they don't see that much, but they only do Facebook actually. So they don't really do Twitter. That's one of the things. Um, and, and again, they're so, you know, they're so proud of what I'm doing that, that, it, that it would take quite a lot to, to budge them on that. But, um, yeah, people who love you find it quite hard. My very good friend, uh, found it just you know that recent um, issue um, found it very very hard um, it's very very it is it does take a toll on people you care for and they see more than you do so that so like my husband's twitter timeline is nowhere near as busy as mine um, and he gets notifications every time I post anything and he goes and reads what people are saying about it which you know I just don't have time to do that um, so yeah it, it, it isn't it's not and as Molly says they didn't sign up for it so um, I am so glad my husband's a technophobe because he would <laughs> probably just go off on one <laughs> and probably have to resign. By one thing, I think that's a really good point about, um, you know, other people see more than we do. And one thing that I've done is I've switched off notifications for accounts that don't follow me on Twitter, because I think if someone doesn't follow me, then they're not really, they're generally speaking, not engaging in good faith anyway. So that has removed a lot of the, the, the horrible stuff from my, my own, from what I see. But of course, that's not the same for friends and family. They see that stuff. And um, a lot of the time I'm, I'm sort of living in ignorant bliss, I, I would say. And as you mentioned, like they're not, um, maybe they're not as prepared as you would be to actually go and, and accept those comments as well. Indeed. I mean, I so, so so what happened to me recently over the last few months was that a colleague at work um, swore at me at committee. And that was not online. That was in a public um, sphere um, during committee process when we were making legislation. And the fallout after that, so I guess like my husband was already feeling quite sensitive about it. Um, and the fallout online after that, because it turns out when somebody abuses you in public in real life, everybody piles on in social media. Um, so that just meant I spent several weeks cleaning my timeline after that to make sure that I wasn't getting quite so many abusive uh, messages from folk. Um, and I think, I suppose there's a lesson in there. So firstly, People can cope with it, um, depending on what else is happening in their lives. So I don't think my husband would have been so sensitive to the online abuse if it hadn't been that I had actually been abused in real life as well. And I don't think, um, you know, I, I, I think that all of those people wouldn't have piled on me. I mean, they wouldn't have been anywhere near my Twitter line had the, had the real life incident not occurred. And I think we all need to be aware. And I mean, you know, I, I can remember some fairly appalling public conversations around the EU referendum when we were having town hall meetings for that. You know, you need to be aware that some people are abusive in real life as well. In fact, an awful lot of those keyboard warriors are abusive in real life as well. And it does happen in real life as well. It doesn't just happen online. It does happen, you know, at town hall meetings and. Um, at surgeries and all of the, the normal things. So we kid ourselves if we think it's just online. Online makes it easier to access you, I think. So Twitter, it's easier to find you and speak to you directly. 
but um, it, it, you know, there are women particularly, because I, I, I don't believe my colleague would have spoken to me like that if I was a man. So women in particularly do receive abuse and that happens in real life as well as online. Uh, that's a very important thing that you're saying. And you were mentioning before that most of the abusive comments come from men. Um, and you were mentioning also about the uh, comment about the RP. So um, I'm trying to think, um, is that some, like um, something about women going into politics and taking decision-making positions that makes men threat feel threatened or uh, what do you think about that? Um, I don't know, uh, Molly, do you want to start this one? Well, I think it's it's just kind of an online manifestation of what we already knew in society, which is that, you know, there is inherent sexism everywhere. Um, and um, in terms of uh, in terms of men feeling threatened, I'm not sure. Um, I find with the comments I get, it's just it's 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 more about just not having any any respect for what I'm saying because I'm a woman and because I'm um, you know on the younger side for for a politician. I think that's the biggest thing is is this, this the perception that um, my views or my opinion shouldn't be counted or listened to because um, you know because of my gender and my age, um, which is obviously nonsense but that's for me that's that's what I perceive as as one of the bigger barriers and what about you Rhoda and just wanting to ask Molly I mean there's a lot of young men in politics as well I, I just wonder if it is more a, a, a sexist thing for the they know they can point out your age because you're a woman um as opposed to you know, you kind of get the, you know, the young man and I'm, I'm kind of thinking of folk like Ross Greer when he became, now he might have got negatives, but I just thought that um, he got a lot of positives, you know, a young man taking on politics and youngest MSB and um, he got, I suppose, a lot of media attention because of that. I mean, that's, that's kind of, I suppose, but at the very beginning, and it was, I thought he got a lot of positive attention because of it. So I just wonder if it, if the underlying sexism um, comes to the fore more if you're a young woman, because, you know, for all the reasons that sexism happens, um, but you know a young woman probably you know is even worse than, than a woman kind of taking a lead to some of those people i, I think know. i think that's right i i think there's a, a lot of the gendered language you get you wouldn't really see sent to a man things like you know um you know she looks naive or you know she looks like a schoolgirl or little girl these kinds of things they don't really translate to, to men and i think we, pos we, we probably view young men getting involved in politics more positively um, because a lot of, of a lot of those just, you know, societal um, understandings, that, and understandings that we have. But it's so true that just in general, there are more men and more young men involved in politics than young women. And um, when you look at the sort of um, comments you get online, I think, you know, I think I understand why young women and, and why my friends, for example, don't get involved. Um, why would you want to subject yourself to that? So I, I think that's probably correct. I think there's a there's a real gendered element. Mm -hmm. No, I just wondered when I was, because it wasn't my perception of what happened to young men, but um, I think it's a lot of this is about, yeah. And, and those kind of people are out there and they have those opinions. And I think sometimes social media um, gives them another platform to express them. Some of them might not be brave enough to come and say it to your face. Um, but, you know, if they can do it, then so block, block, block. It's kind of my, <laughs> my, my yeah. advice. <laughs> 
I'm thinking that, especially if you're a woman, it's a bit more, it's not a bit, it's a lot more difficult to go into certain positions such as, again, politics or other um, other sectors that where women are less represented. So um, it's starting to get, of course, a bit better, but uh, you tend to have to do double, triple the work that a man would have normally to get there. So it technically should be the opposite. So you technically may actually have a bit more experience than a male counterpart because it's you've already had to um, go beyond a few other hurdles. What what do you think about that? I suppose you're, you're absolutely right. You don't have that sort of white male privilege. And uh, I expect, you know, when you when we think about politicians, and it's funny, you know, all those cultural cues are there from a very young age. I talk a lot about um, a visit I had to a nursery um, a couple of years ago where I, I was hunkered down at a table doing a jigsaw with a wee boy of four. And, uh, you know, when a minister visits, there's always a big entourage, you know, and there was this day as well. And the only person in the entourage who was a man was a photographer and he had, you know, camera slung around his neck and things. So I'm hunkered down at this table doing a jigsaw with this wee boy and he turns to me and he says, are you, and he said, he pointed to the, the photographer and he said, is he the government? And I said, no, I'm, I'm the government. And he said, but you can't be the government. You're a girl. And I was thinking, you know, by the time he was four, and that's now, that's a couple of years ago, you know, that's now in this current day and age, by the time he was four, he had absorbed those cultural cues which told him that the government was men. And he'd absorbed them so well that he was able to ignore all of the visual cues that told him that that man was a photographer. Um, so it is, it is quite ingrained. I do wonder if it's more ingrained up here in the Highlands. So it is more difficult for women to be involved in politics, largely, you know, those other barriers like having responsibility for childcare and things, you know, I have to be away from my family mm -hmm. every week, which is a commitment that we've made as a family. But, you know, those are, um, are difficulties and challenges that not every family are willing to overcome in order to participate. Um, there's a tradition, and I, you know, I come from the West Highlands, so does, so does Rhoda. There's a tradition in some of our religious um, bodies that women should not be in leadership positions. So, you know, it's considered quite um, unusual for women to stand up and speak and lead the way. Um, so there's all that once you scratch the surface, and particularly in the Highlands and Islands, I think there are, and you know, the fact is we haven't seen so many examples. So, you know, things are, are much better now uh, than they ever were, but there's still, we're still only a third of the representatives in the, in the Highlands are women, only a third of the representatives in the Scottish Parliament are women. You know, we're still not quite managing um, to get over the line. And I think for all those reasons, it becomes a bit tricky for people to put their heads above the parapet and get involved. And if you add to that, that when you do put your head above the parapet, you get abused. <laughs> and women, you know, I, do, I hate using gender stereotypes, but women tend to be more collaborative. They tend to try and find solutions rather than to fight um, and be adversarial. And, you know, our politics in, in, in Scotland, as all over the UK, tends to be more adversarial than co collaborative and um, consensus building. So, you know, there's lots of reasons for women not to get involved. But... Yeah. Uh, yeah, and there's also the distance. I don't, I don't know, what, Molly, what you're thinking, but I know there's a big issue for young women. I mean, we've seen women in this part, you know, this was supposed to be the family friendly parliament and whatever, but a number of women from various parties stepping down because of family and, you know, just having, you know, different, um, well, just doesn't help, I don't think. And when you think of the traveling, even for the council, you know, if you were in Highland Council, the amount of travelling, Western Isles Council, no women councillors at all. And, yeah. you know, a lot of that would be travelling. If you were from the Southern Isles and the Western Isles, you're away from home for a considerable amount of time. Um, and 
you know, even within the parliament, the childcare facilities are grim for MSPs. They're great if you want to pop in and um, watch a debate, but they are not there as a, it's not a workplace assistance at all. So it makes it really difficult. I, mean, I don't know how we change that. And, you know, I've heard people comment that the pandemic changed the way the parliament worked that would never have been changed to allow women you know so it's almost like your wee four-year-old where you know it's all and they say this about health as well that a woman goes to the doctor complaining of feeling unwell then it must be in her mind if a man goes to the doctor complaining of feeling unwell it's obviously physical um, you know, and he's dying, so he needs, you know, there are so many ingrained um, disparities that it's actually quite sad to think, how do, you, how do you change this? I mean, you're saying that it's more difficult from, like, for in, in the Highlands, maybe, as a, as a, it's more of an issue in the Highlands, do you feel like people, maybe women in the, living in the Central Belt, for instance, have a bit more of an easier, let's say, life into getting into politics? Well, I, I suppose the simple fact that you can be home every night uh, if you live in the Central Belt makes a difference. So in the, if you're a Highlands representative, or as I am a Highlands and Islands representative, even when you're at home, the area that I represent is half the landmass of Scotland. So prior to the pandemic, when I was at home, I might be in Shetland, I might be in Orkney, I might be down in Isla. You know, so all of these things involve overnight stays. You're not going to manage to cover the patch without staying away from home a fair bit. And that's just the reality of the job. That is just the way it is. And I think that that is harder for women than for men. Now, you know, it is changing. And I, I, I think, you know, men, I mean, we, we've got three children. I think men are pretty important in children's lives. And it, it, it shouldn't just be accepted that men are, are able to stay away from home or work away from home and, and it has no impact. But these are difficult, um, you know, decisions and balances that families have to make for themselves. And there are times when your family really need you and there will be, you know, we've had that in the, this five years, times when you really, you know, wanted to be at home and you were actually somewhere else. Um, you know, but I, I think that is a challenge. And it, I mean, I hate saying it's for women, but that's the reality. Um, however much we would like to wish it different, and the pandemic has shone a light on that as well. However much we would like to wish it different and to think that we were more equal, the bulk of caring still falls on women and the bulk of caring responsibility still inhibits women from fulfilling their potential and taking up these roles. I think in, in terms of it being more difficult in the Highlands as well, there's also, um, you know, there's, a, there's an element of particularly women of working age, a lot of people go south to, to work, to find jobs. Um, and I think it's, it's a big ask to firstly be able to survive in the Highlands um, and, and, you know, have a job up here. That's difficult in itself. But to then, you know, commit to, um, you know, campaigning and, and working towards um, being in politics as well, whether at council or um, parliamentary level, that is a really, really difficult thing. And then that's even that that's not even counting things like potential child care responsibilities and those kinds of things. So the, the barriers, I think, in the Highlands are exaggerated in, in comparison to to other parts of Scotland. Do you think like with the fact that with the pandemic, most of our lives have been on Zoom, as we see now, but like they've shifted online. So do you think that maybe this can be something that will make it a bit more accessible to women to actually become representatives at all? I think it will, but we'll need to be careful. So we'll need to, I think there are times when you really need to be in a room with each other and you really need to be eyeballing each other. Um, and there are times when many of these meetings can just happen like this. And we just need to be careful to get the balance right. So prior to the pandemic in the Highlands and Islands, we were doing a lot of meetings like this. Um, but when we were meeting with folks from the central belt, we were at a disadvantage because we were the ones coming in by video conferencing and things as it was then. Um, and you are definitely less able 
to speak up, less able to interact, and you don't get that chance to catch someone in the room and just have a quiet word in their ear that you might get in a real face-to-face -face meeting. So if the rest of the world goes back to real face-to-face -face meetings, we're going to need to make sure that our representatives are still at the table um, in order to make sure that we still you know, have a strong voice. Um, I think the balance will shift towards more of this kind of working. You know, I can't imagine. I think the other thing is I kind of miss human beings. I really miss people. <laughs> so I'm kind of looking forward to being in a place where you talk face to face with real life human beings. But I think we'll all be thinking about meetings. Do they need to happen like this? Or, or do they need to happen in real life? The other thing as a Highlands and Islands representative is, is nothing is, you know, nothing gives you quite the same sense of a place and its challenges as actually being there. So if we all um, just zoom around the Highlands and Islands rather than physically in real, real life going there, I think we'll lose something. So we're going to have to, we are going to have to strike a balance. But um, yeah, there's a lot of meetings we used to have that I just think, well, we could surely manage that online. Of course, that might oh, mean that we have to be near home or near Wi-Fi. <laughs> so that might prove another challenge for us in the Highlands and Islands as we roam around all over the place. We'll need a good connection to get to all the meetings we're meant to be going to. What do you think about this, Rhoda? <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I kind of agree with what Marie is saying about, you know, you need that face to face and the last thing you want is all the women to be coming in from a distance virtually and all the men to be in the room making the plans after the meeting because we all know that it's a chat that goes on around the meeting that is, and that's what we miss on Zoom to an extent and that, the, that relationship building that exchange of views that kind of getting people on side so we just have to be kind of careful I think it works well and I suppose as a rule of thumb I would be kind of saying if it's remote it's re everyone's remote you know if you're coming in um, virtually then everyone should come in virtually and if not you should be trying to get together now that then says well that doesn't help people with caring um responsibilities if you but then at the same time if you know for instance i live in inverness so even over the pandemic what's taught me is that you know i spend you know 70 hours traveling every week just back and forth to the parliament and there was one week I just said, I have no time to travel. I am so busy. I can't find that gap in my diary without stopping several times en route to have to zoom from the car, which I've done a number of times, just trying to, to fit that in. And I think people just assume as well that if it's zoom, you can do it at any time. That's um, so, you know, it, it, it is quite it would be quite tempting all the time to do this because you can be in so many places much more easily, but you do miss out. And, you know, that, that and okay, that chat is not happening at the moment because people can't, even if you're in the parliament, you've got your social distancing and as you're not having the same kind of interaction as you would have normally, but let's hope this is all gonna finish so that, we can sit and have a coffee and a blather and um, not have to shout at each other over, you know, you can't have a private conversation just now because you're shouting at people. So you you need to include the whole room. Um, so it, it, it is a difficult one because where you can see the opportunities um, for women to get more involved and have that work-life balance you also see the pitfalls where women just get shut out of a whole part of this that would leave them at a, a disadvantage as well. And I don't know how you overcome that. Um, is it a compromise? That Then I'm sick as a woman of having that compromise. I think, you know, 
we need to find ways. And if this was happening to men, we would have already found a way. Gosh, I'm, I'm thinking as you speak about some of the things. So I said that in the Highlands and Islands, we were already using this technology more. And I was thinking our Wester Ross SNP branch, so Wester Ross is the biggest council ward in the whole of Europe. It's vast. And when we get together as a branch, people are having to travel hours to our branch meetings, you know, if they're in Garb or if they're in Ullipo, you know, they're just the sheer uh, vastness of Wester Ross. And we had a lassie who, that's what made us um, investigate in technology and also the improving sort of 4G and broadband and Wi-Fi and things. So we could meet in our village hall in Garve and a lassie from Atabu who was breastfeeding could FaceTime in <laughs> to our branch meeting. And you think, you're right, we might have found these solutions sooner <laughs> if it had been men. Um, but actually, you know, Technology will enable more women to take part. It will enable more women to connect. And I suppose 2014, um, that um, exercise in democracy brought a whole load of new people. I was one of them, a whole load of new people into, into politics. And that might also disrupt um, the pandemics and other disruptors. So, you know, surely we will see um, things change going forward. Some of the good things that have happened will continue. I think it's about choice. I think we, that's what we want in the future is, is that, you know, women and people in the Highlands and Islands have the choice of if they want to go to Parliament or if they want to go, you know, dial in remotely. I think that that's probably the optimal place is just having as much flexibility as possible. No, definitely. And there's talking about compromise as well which probably it's a com compromises that some men won't have to do or like will have find solution more quickly uh, for them i'm trying to think going back to online abuse as well um is it something that um maybe uh, sometimes as a politician as a female politician many can perceive either as complete deterrent or something that comes in with the job as you were mentioning is something that um, comes in with the job, but um, how, to what level should this be tolerated? Because to what level is this, uh, ac is it acceptable to consider it as part of the job? I, think, I don't think it should be part of the job. I don't think people should ever be abused at their work. And I just don't, you know, it's just unacceptable. Um, and, and we shouldn't tolerate it. I think that the adversarial nature of politics and the, you know, aggression with which some people conduct their politics does a disservice to the country. So it does prevent people from getting involved. And I think it is largely women who are put off by that, you know, sort of aggressive way of conducting um, politics. And I think that means that we have a whole lot of people who, who, firstly don't put themselves forward i mean in some other countries um you know a lot more it's a lot more common for people to be involved in politics than it is in scotland it's quite rare for people to be involved in politics full stop gender society so i think um it, it it means that a whole lot of people are disengaged and don't put themselves forward i think the country's a better place if we have representation that represents us instead of it being an elite few who manage to get through but the worst thing I think that happens is that disengagement with politics. So I think it puts people off political debate and it puts people off voting even at the worst end of it. So if it's seen to be a nasty sphere or something that people don't, you know, really don't want to get involved and in, then it puts people off and that sort of I suppose that's where the trolling comes in so less the abuse more the just the sniping away from the sidelines which people just switch off and swathes to that they can't you know that's not a great way to conduct politics at all. Uh, Molly how do you see that as someone who is uh, starting her career in politics fairly recently? Well, I mean, I agree. I don't think it should be part of part of the job. I, I do think that, you know, it was one of the biggest 
things on my mind when I was preparing to um to stand was you know uh, all of these things in the back of my head like you know oh I should make my Facebook more private or you know I should um you know check who's following me on Twitter I, I should you know look at my Instagram all of these types of things um I, I think there's just a lot of wariness that that people um who have probably people who've maybe been in um politics for for a long time or or um or indeed are, are men who wouldn't really think of these things just didn't have to worry about um and it's interesting to watch my you know fellow political candidates um who are men from all parties dealing with things very differently and not having those considerations um when they're starting out um and i have to say Say that um, I've had you know messages of um, support from from men of, of all different parties checking in about because they see the things that I get sent and sometimes I amplify them just so so everyone knows what kind of rubbish um, we're subjected to but um, certainly they will say things like you know you're, you're having a really hard time I'm not is there anything I can do um, and um, you know I would love for for, for men to be sort of calling out this kind of behavior more. Um, but uh, it certainly, um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a different consideration um, for women. And uh, it, 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 we need to find some sort of solution to it. I don't know exactly what that is. And I think it's probably about um, raising the tone in general because that will then reflect um, online. But uh, yeah, it, it, it's a problem as it stands. No, definitely. And uh, you mentioned that the fact that they don't really have to think about these issues sometimes. Do you think that there is enough like awareness across uh, male politicians um, and in, in, well, in your party or in other parties um, about this issue? Um, is there do they know enough about what um, their female counterparts have to go through? And uh, if not, what what can be done about it? I think they definitely they definitely know on a sort of logical level what's happening, but I don't think there's always that understanding of how, how it permeates and how it can sometimes be quite subtle in the way that you're being sidelined or, or um, you know, um, sniped at, as Marie said. So I think that's something that, that comes with time and experience that you, you learn to sort of notice those things for what they are and navigate them, but it's not always obvious to people who are not experiencing that on a daily basis. I don't, I don't think men do notice it, to be honest. I mean, I, I'm just thinking um, just in normal everyday life, you know, I've had men work for me as well as women in the office. And it's quite funny sometimes when you're in a meeting and you've got a man assistant with you, quite often the conversation is directed to the man and you're just sitting there and thinking, you know, do you not want to speak to me at all? You know, it's kind of, it is really weird. Um, and I don't think they notice it. I honestly don't. I pointed it out to them, <laughs> you know, and they're like, oh, oh, you know, but it's just kind of, um, I, I, and I, I suppose they see it, but I don't think they recognize it for what it is. And I think recently with some of this, um, discussion about sexism and what you know a woman um almost I don't know when you as a woman or a girl and, and it is as a girl realize that you have to take steps to ensure your own safety. Um and I I think that came as a shock to a lot of men that probably their daughters at a very, very young age are already calculating. And it's the same in day-to-day -day life as it is online. And I think if you would speak to the generation of girls coming up just now and ask them how they behave online, you'd probably be quite interested to find, it would probably be horrific actually, to find the steps they probably take starting at a very young age to keep themselves safe online. Um, it's, it's kind of a thing that we, and I'm talking about the wee boy that you met at the primary school, but it's a thing that's ingrained in all of us to an extent. And what's ingrained in women is 
keep yourself safe. No, how dare somebody try and harm you? I think you're absolutely right, Rhoda. And I think um, I'll give you a couple of examples from my own life that kind of illustrate that. So there was one time I got invited to a parliamentary event in a like in a private club, it was a dinner and, I, and of 20 people sitting at the table, I was the only female and, and they hadn't appreciated it until it happened. So all of the men and the men organising it hadn't realised that they got the optics quite so wrong until it happened and everyone was very apologetic. And I remember as I left that um, evening and I was walking out, somebody thanked me for a lovely evening. They thought I was a member of the waiting staff. <laughs> and that's happened to me a couple of times at events um, and my husband who's an accountant uh, goes to a lot of events and I you know we kind of laugh about it and I said have you ever had that happen to you at an event where somebody's mistaken you for a member of the waiting staff and he said never so there's there's just things that happen to us that don't happen to men and they can't be aware of them the other thing I'm a more serious one so so um, when you say about, um, you know, men don't see these things, they don't feel it the same way as we do. And in the same way as that boy had absorbed all those cultural cues and thought that, you know, government had to be a man, we absorb, we women absorb all those cultural cues and we do little things without even noticing to keep ourselves safe all the time. So when I describe Twitter as a crowded bar like I literally do navigate a crowded bar that way I would be you know as any woman would be I'd be checking to see who might be aggressive towards me in a situation like that and I think um, it came home to me most vividly uh, recently when as I said that incident where a colleague um, swore at me at work and when I initially so it happened he was on mute and in a zoom meeting like this at a committee situation making legislation and he snarled f you marie at me and when the officials noticed it at the time and i kind of laughed it off and thought oh he'll be in big trouble now for swearing at work in parliament on record but um I imagined it, that was that. But actually, when I look back over the footage, his face was contorted with aggression and rage, and it really disturbed me. So, and I saw that, as we say, I saw that incident as a woman who spends her life, you know, as we all do, checking for aggression everywhere we go. And over the weekend, it all blew up on Twitter and things. And over the weekend, the Deputy First Minister contacted me. I'm his junior minister. And he said, are you all right? Are you all right with what's happened? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. I said, but what's going to happen when I next see him? And I was, as a woman, primed for actual violence. And the Deputy First Minister, who's a man, had not a thought in his head that what had happened verbally could translate into physical violence. That I, as a 48-year-old woman who's navigated, you know, life, as we all said, and has to take steps everywhere I go to make sure that I'm not a victim of male aggression, felt that incident very, very differently. And I suppose it, it was a real um, eye-opener to me that a man wouldn't even think for a second that that verbal aggression might translate into physical aggression. Whereas for me, it was very hard to dismiss the concern that it might translate into physical aggression. And that's just a complete contrast between male experience and female experience, I would say. Yeah, that's quite interesting. I'm thinking also, where does the, the line, uh, where is the line between what happens online and then can get to you in your real life because sometimes the things are trolling we dismiss it saying that it's just something online but then it can actually impact your real life it can actually become real in some cases there's of course threats that are substantial and can be have to be reported to the police so um where do you um where do you find that line and have you ever been in a situation where that has threatened you like an online threat has been 
threatening you in, in person. So I have um, I have one chap who regularly messages me, and I think he's known to the police, but that's never translated into a real life um, incident. I suppose quite early on in my career, because I spent 20 years working in mental health, and there was one chap who would um, regularly post things online about me and about my colleague Kate Forbes, um, and he would approach us in real life as well. Um, but I, I knew him <laughs> from my previous life, <laughs> from working in the hospital, and I knew that he wasn't well. Um, and I also, I suppose, I risk assessed that differently um, because I knew from having known him before that he probably wasn't a physical risk to me. But the police did get involved in that because regardless of what I knew, um, other people were very alarmed by his behaviour. So, you know, I think there was a court order to prevent him from pro approaching us. Um, but that's the only time I've had to have the police involved. And it wasn't, as I say, specifically um, me who got the police involved in that situation. It was that he was causing alarm to many other people ar around me. But yeah, it, 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 there is a, I suppose, there is a fine line over where um, you think um, police involvement is necessary or, you know, I, I would be, I mean, if some of the people who, who said things, that the things that they say about me online were there in front of me saying this, that would definitely be, I would have thought, a police incident. I would have been quite concerned by someone confronting me and saying something so aggressive. But as I said, largely, you know, in my experience, they're kind of keyboard warriors. They're not, they're not like that when you meet them in real life. <laughs> but... That's not to say that there isn't aggression in politics and isn't, I mean, you know, since, so during this term of parliament, um, the, our colleague Joe Cox in, in the UK parliament was murdered. And that to me just really brought home to me the really, you know, challenging um, it, balance that we strike in terms of what do we ignore and what do we need to pay attention to. Um, and, you know, that was a, the most horrific incident. And I don't think we have quite absorbed the lessons from that um, yet. You know, it was, um, you know, just, I, I'll never forget the day it happened. And, you know, driving up the road, I meet myself and Kate Forbes were car, you know, driving up the road together and just in tears listening to it on the, on the radio thinking, goodness me, you know, that could be us, that could be anyone. Um, we know simply for being in public life. So, you know, you can, you need, need to be alert that there can be dangers and strong passions can be ignited and not ignore um, all of that. I, I think something that, um, that the public probably doesn't realize is that, you know, as candidates, we've all received advice from the police um, going into our campaigns about keeping safe and, I know that um, for those who are elected in May, there will be um, security measures put in place for every single one of them. And that's, I think it's quite shameful that we've reached a place in our public life where that sort of stuff is not only necessary, but, um, you know, quite normal to, to many of us now. Um, you know, recently I, I received a, um, a parcel in the post to my house um, and I live by myself and I received this parcel that had no note um, it was just um, my name um, and address and then um, what looked like, um, you know, like a plastic bag uh, and in it was some like paper towel and then in that there was something else. Um, and it turned out to be um, little, little miniatures of whiskey that someone had sent me um, from the Isles, which was very nice of them, but uh, as someone I knew. But my first thought was, oh, you know, someone someone's not liking my campaign, someone doesn't like me, and they've sent me something threatening in the post. That was my first thought. And I was terrified for a full five minutes until I figured out what it was. And I think that the, the, the fact that we've got that fear in our public life is, is really, really, you know, a terrible indictment on, on um, you know, what, what politics in Scotland has become in, in recent years. And that's must be it's terrible feeling as well. Um, 
do you think that that is something that a men counterpart would have felt in the same way? I actually told a, a, a male colleague about it and he he was like, oh, ha, ha, you know, so funny that that happened. And then I was like, no, not funny. That was terrifying. So definitely that it's not perceived in the same way at all. Sorry, Rada, you wanted to say something. No, I'm just thinking about, I'm just thinking about that. I, I, hmm. That might be scary. Surely that would be scary for every, anybody if you're kind of um, faced with something. Um, because there was a time when people were sending envelopes with white powder to MS in the parliament. And I think everybody that was affected by that was really scared. And it wasn't, it was a hoax, but, you know, um, everybody who came into contact with that was quite scared because you didn't know what it was and you didn't um so I think there are you know I, th I think where it's different is women are more just highly tuned to danger because they have to be and um, I think once the danger is spotted and realized then you know men will be afraid also it's just that they're maybe not um they don't have to face it so often so they're maybe not quite as attuned as women to it and um, i think that would be that would be my thinking because i think anybody else opening that parcel would probably think oh what's that you know so my my husband orders loads of stuff from ebay in my name because he can't he can't actually set up his own eBay account. So every parcel that comes to this house just lands in his chair because I just assume it's for him um, rather than me. So yeah. <laughs> maybe, got, I maybe need to make him more. <laughs> I've got a husband who's a very avid online shopper as well, and we're parcel central here. So I don't think a parcel would alarm me. Um, but you're right. It is something about how alert women have, need to be. Um, to the dangers that we might face. And I suppose what, I, what we're all saying is that we kind of absorb that um, as women at a very young age, and we take steps to make sure that we stay safe from you know, a very young age. And, and I don't think that guys have to do that largely. Um, you know, women are, are much more um, needing to be alert than men are, and that's a, a sad reality of life. I have one last question. Um, how do we make um, internet and uh, um, in general online the web a safer place for and more welcoming place for um, female politicians as well and just a place where maybe more women can see re themselves reflected and see more models as well to aspire to? I think I, th I think you have to, and I think this is the thing, you know, if you compare Facebook with Twitter, Facebook, the person has to be that person. You know, you can't hide between behind the aliases in the same way. Well, you can set up fake accounts, of course you can, but not in the same way. Um, so I think if social media insisted that they knew who each and every person was, um, and it's about that thing about I always kind of I think your mother is always the the the, the yardstick you use if you wouldn't say it in front of your mother don't say it at all and if you were identified um, and your mother could spot it then I think that just it it puts you know and there will always be people who would be nasty to your face far less you know so there there are there are bad people there but there are people who allow a side of them to be seen that they wouldn't want known to other people you know so um, I think it would make it safer I think also just but raising awareness for people you know all people um how they use social media I think is important and you know there are really good women out there on social media using it really well um I think it's a remember you can block remember to report um you know, don't accept it 
you wouldn't accept it for anyone else to accept it for yourself. Yeah, I, I would agree. So I, I do report things if I think they're unacceptable. Um, and I, I don't know what ever happens with those things. You know, I'm not sure I actually managed to ever get them stopped. But um, I think that that's a very good advice. I don't block anyone, um, but I do mute people. Um, and I mute conversations if they're um, all getting a bit grim. And I don't want to see that sort of stuff. So you can manage what you see yourself. Um, I think that as leaders and as politicians, we all have a really important role to play in conducting ourselves um, in a manner that's respectful and um, in, you know, having, I mean, nobody would expect everybody to have the same views. So we need to be able to, um, and it wouldn't be a very, you know, normal country or interesting country if we did all have the same views. <laughs> so we need to be able to um, lead by example, I think is quite important in terms of how we conduct ourselves and how we interact with people that we disagree with. Um, I think that, um, you know, for example, um, when, you know, that colleague snarled abuse at me at work that did unleash a whole lot of stuff online and I think I'm I, I know that that might have happened anyway but I think that if somebody in a leadership position conduct themselves that way it probably does um, encourage other people to think it's okay to do it um, I think we can conduct ourselves quite positively as well so I mentioned my daily mile you know um, if we are putting positive things out there it can be a more positive place. Um, there's a young lassie, uh, a young care experienced lassie just now who for the whole of this year has been putting out every day positive vibes and she tags me in it. And actually it's a really lovely way to start the day. You know, it's, um, it, it is, we can create a more positive atmosphere ourselves, both by putting positive things into it and by not in you know by being careful about how we engage and debate ourselves you know i think we can disagree per i mean i'm perfectly comfortable with disagreement uh, we don't need to be aggressive or slinging abuse at each other uh, and we shouldn't do that in real life and we shouldn't do it online either i think um i'm wary of of you know things like you know, ideas to outlaw online anonymity and things like that, because I, I, I see a real risk with, you know, existing vulnerable communities or vulnerable people, um, you know, such as adolescents who might be, you know, learning more about themselves and trying to find a way to express themselves that's not safe in their home environment. And I would never want to, you know, prevent that. Um, and I think as well, I mean, I've been following quite closely the online harms bill going through the UK Parliament and various pieces of legislation around the world to strengthen online safety. Um, and in general, I mean, I think platforms have a bigger role to play, um, but we're never going to be able to effectively legislate the Internet. It's moving too quickly. Um, and I, I don't think, in all honesty, that legislators have a solid enough expert understanding to keep up with it. Um, in my view, change has to start in, in real life um, interactions. And I think there, there needs to be most, much more robust political leadership from our leaders in Scotland and, and elsewhere in the world as well to stand up and unequivocally say this is wrong, um, whatever, what, whatever the viewpoint is and whatever side you're backing. Unfortunately, I don't think that's going to be forthcoming because I, I don't think it's particularly um, politically helpful for for various for various leaders to do so. But I, I think if we were all, you know, very, very true with ourselves and very brave about it, that's what we would do as one united force is stand up and all say together, this isn't on. Um, but we are a long way from that. And uh, generally speaking, I do think that our online discourse will improve if our if our real life discourse improves as well. 
That's great. Thank you so much, Tavern, for your time. It's been great and very fascinating to talk to you this morning. And uh, yeah, let's hope that we can get the internet to become a better place and uh, in general, more inviting for women to get into politics. Thank That's you. Good. Thanks very much. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a, Have a lovely day. <laughs> Cheers. <Enjoy> Bye. <laughs> yes. Enjoy Bye. Bye. <laughs>